uh, joining us today for this uh, live webinar on uh, food and intercultural dialogue between Italy and Sudan, and particularly on the work of Pellegrino Artusi and uh, the current efforts here in Sudan with the Sudanese Kitchen Project led by uh, Chef Omer Altijani. Uh, I thank you, uh, President Laila Tentoni, for joining us, and Director Patrito of Casa Artusi, which is a partner of uh, the fifth week of the Italian cuisine uh, in the world. And uh, I will now give the floor uh, to the Ambassador, to Ambassador Gianluigi Vassallo, for the opening remarks of uh, this uh, webinar. Please, Ambassador, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fortunato, once again. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, delighted uh, to welcome you all, uh, together with the guests who may be tuning in in the coming um, hour or two, to this webinar centered on this cultural dialogue on food and cuisine between Italy and, and Sudan. I'm particularly uh, delighted, I'm particularly happy the uh, President Laila Tentoni, Director Susi Patrito, and Chef Omer Tigani could, uh, you know, uh, join us for this for this conversation, which will make it uh, all all the more inspiring. Uh, there's a number there's a number of reasons why I am so thrilled to be uh, with you all uh, today. Uh, the Settimana della Cucina Italiana, the Week of Italian Cuisine, is something the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation organizes uh, yearly because food and cuisine is uh, so much a part of what we do in a number of ways. Food is business, food is culture, food is a way of life. And in no country is this more true than in, uh, in Italy. So it's actually a cross section of everything we do and, and part of our dialogue with uh, partner and friendly countries such as, such as Sudan. This seminar today particularly highlights the very close connection that there is between what we eat and our cultural heritage. Food, not just as fuel, something we need to function in our everyday life, but something which is closely linked to our habits, to our history, to our beliefs, to our culture, to the way we relate with one another. And if you think that 200 years ago, someone in Italy decided that there was a, an heritage, that there was a tradition, that there was a body of recipes, as if there was a body of legislation that he could put in a code so that it could be used by future generations, is nothing short of a miracle for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's often said that Italians are a people of 60 millions of football coaches, because each of us has an idea on how a football match should be, uh, you know, should be run. It is no less true, in my opinion, that we're a people of 60 millions of cooks. Each of us has his or her own ideas, women and men alike, of a certain recipe. So to have someone who actually says, this is, the, this is the true version, this is how it should be done in Italy, is a very brave enterprise. And it says much for the value of that work, 
that it still is 200 years after the text of reference for the, the, the core of Italian cooking. It also points out to another reality, which I found to be true in my own country. As far as food is, con is concerned, Italians tend to be fairly conservative. We have a bulk of tradition in, in, in matters of food, which has been passed through generations and has reached the current, uh, the current time. And the work of Pellegrino Artusi and its relevance is evidence of what, uh, of what we're saying. So perhaps I like to Italians whether tradition is as much a part of their way of cooking as it was in the past or whether you see a change in habits. That, that is interesting for me as an Italian citizen to know. And then all the more interesting uh, compared to this attitude of ours is that someone in Sudan is trying to do very much the same thing in this vast country with a large population and a very diverse population, don't let's forget Sudan is at least six times as big as Italy. It's, it's huge. And there's a variety of traditions, there's a variety of cultures, there's a variety of habits. So if Pellegrino Artusi was brave, you, Omer, are crazy. What, what gave you this idea? How do you see the attitude of the Sudanese people as a whole towards food? What brought you to the idea of writing this, uh, this book? Um, I I will, I, I will speak no more because you have much more interesting things to say, so I look forward to listening. But once again, I am thrilled that we are having this discussion. It is a field where it's stimulating to compare. Thank you all for finding the time. It is a pleasure and a privilege to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, we will discover more about uh, more about the craziness of Omer later. <laughs> now I will <laughs> give the floor uh, to President Antoni that will uh, deliver a speech in Italian and I will translate uh, for our uh, Sudanese audience. Uh, President Antoni, uh, la parola a lei. Buongiorno. Buongiorno a tutti, io faccio questo sentitissimo, cari, carissimo saluto da Forlimpopoli, da Casa Artusi Forlimpopoli, una piccola città di 14.000 abitanti di origine romana, una città antica, al cuore della Romagna, nord Italia, e questa piccola città è salita alle cronache, direi, del mondo, proprio per aver dato i Natali a Pellegrino Artusi, padre riconosciuto della lingua e della cucina italiana. Good morning everyone. Uh, I am speaking now from Forlimpopoli, uh, a small town in Romagna. A small town has uh, been uh, become famous uh, also because uh, it is the place where Pellegrino Artusi uh, was born. Pellegrino uh, Artusi, which is the recognized father of uh, the language and cuisine in, uh, in Italy. Come sapete, la quinta edizione della Settimana della Cucina Italiana nel Mondo, la manifestazione promossa dalla Farnesina per promuovere le eccellenze agroalimentari 
italiane quest'anno è dedicata alla dieta mediterranea nel decennale nel, sì, nel decimo anniversario dell'iscrizione nel patrimonio dell'UNESCO e anche all'opera del gastronomo forlimpopolese che vive nel futuro, secondo la nostra definizione, la definizione di Casa Artusi, a 200 anni dalla nascita. Quindi sono davvero felice di questa occasione. Credo la prima volta che Artusi fa capolino in Sudan, per cui ringrazio sinceramente tutti coloro che hanno reso possibile questo incontro e soprattutto l'ambasciatore Gianluigi Vassallo. Le sue parole e devo dire che siamo esattamente in sintonia. Io spesso dico che ciò che noi pensiamo del mondo si vede nel piatto. Il piatto rappresenta la nostra idea del mondo e l'idea di Artusi Brave Art mi piace moltissimo. Uh, so as uh, you know, as uh, you may know, uh, the fifth week of the Italian cuisine this year is focused on two main uh, themes. Uh, first of all, the Mediterranean diet, uh, since uh, this year is the 10th anniversary of uh, its inclusion into the World Intangible Heritage of UNESCO. And uh, as well, uh, it's focused on uh, the the figure of Pellegrino uh, Artusi on the bicentenary of, uh, of his birth. And I am particularly happy uh, then to be here with you uh, today uh, because I think it's the first time that uh, Pellegrino Artusi, that we define as a citizen uh, from, from the future, uh, has reached uh, Sudan. I want to thank you all for organizing uh, this webinar and in particular uh, Ambassador uh, Vassallo for uh, his words, uh, which I share totally. Casatusi, eh, che rappresento, è il primo centro di cultura gastronomica dedicato alla cucina domestica, che opera a Forlimpopoli dal 2007, proprio per valorizzare il pensiero e l'opera artusiana e promuovere la cucina italiana nel mondo. È un lavoro appassionante che pone ovviamente il libro di Artusi, La scienza in cucina e l'arte di mangiare bene, al centro delle nostre azioni. Casa Artusi Foundation ha been working since uh, 2007 in preserving the Italian uh, cultural and gastronomic heritage and uh, much of his work uh, is based on the work by Pellegrino Artusi, uh, Science in the Kitchen and the Art of Eating Well. La scienza in cucina e l'arte di mangiare bene, chiamata spesso col nome dell'autore, l'Artusi, è continuamente pubblicato copiato, piratato, tradotto in tante lingue del mondo. Piaceva alle nonne, quindi non, non poteva... non piacere alle nipoti. ...per portare con loro un pezzo d'Italia fuori d'Italia. Quindi le ragioni di questo successo sono praticamente quasi inestricabili, un successo che non ha termini di paragone. So the work uh, by Pellegrino Artusi is uh, translated into many languages uh, and his success uh, is not uh, linked with a specific uh, uh, Living, period of, live, of life, of his life, because it's a long-lasting success. Uh, he uh, was liked by women in those times, but also today. So that is why his work is still very important nowadays. In estrema sintesi, possiamo dire che Artusi, con una bella lingua, con molta ironia, capacità di racconto e molta pratica, ha colto lo spirito dei tempi, anche dei nostri, e anche perché è un'opera corale. Artusi ha scritto un manuale non soltanto per gli italiani, ma con gli italiani e le italiane, che inviavano per l'appunto consigli e ricette e anche per questo non l'hanno più abbandonato.
what makes uh, Pellegrino Artusi's work uh, so important and still important today is the fact that the work was not just uh, uh, as, uh, the work of a single person. It was uh, uh, participated, a shared book with all uh, the people uh, of Italy. And that's why they still love it uh, today. And they never abandoned the, the book uh, written by Artusi. Artusi, borghese liberale, buon cittadino, ha concepito questo libro partendo da un principio salutistico, obiettivo anche di questa settimana, ma il suo successo è decretato sostanzialmente dal concepire il cibo, proprio come abbiamo detto prima, come diceva prima l'ambasciatore, come cultura, come arti scienze, come stile di vita, come convivialità e scambio continuo. So gastronomy for Artusi was not just uh, uh, something practical, it was related to uh, culture, to lifestyle, and above all to the healthy uh, principles of, uh, of eating. La sua non è una cucina prescrittiva, è una cucina alla portata di tutti, e ciascuno la può fare secondo gusto e con i prodotti che si trovano. Quindi la cucina è sostanzialmente scambio e contaminazione. E risulta evidente dal piatto più caratteristico italiano, gli spaghetti al pomodoro, gli spaghetti arrivano naturalmente dal Medio Oriente, poi dalla Sicilia verso nord e il pomodoro dalle Americhe. Artusi was very much able to understand that uh, cuisine is a matter of cultural exchange and uh, mutual contamination between cultures. If we just think of uh, one of the most common Italian dishes, spaghetti al pomodoro, we have to think that spaghetti come from uh, uh, the Middle East and then through Sicily to the rest of Italy and tomatoes come from the Americas. La cucina italiana richiede sempre buon gusto, una bella lingua, buoni prodotti, convivialità, ma è il frutto delle diversità oppure rarità, come le chiamava Artusi. Quindi la nostra identità è sostanzialmente la sommatoria delle tante eccellenze. So food is... Um is not something uh, related to a simple culture. It's uh, made of multiple identities and the sum of all these identities makes cuisine, uh, Italian cuisine an, an excellence in the world. Noi continuiamo la nostra opera, noi di Casa Artusi in Italia e nel mondo, e continuiamo a farci ispirare dall'Artusi. Pensate soltanto alle tre parole che erano scritte ancora nella prima edizione del libro, 1891. Igiene, igiene, importantissima, economia, non spreco e buon gusto. E queste parole ancora oggi suonano quasi più di un consiglio, quasi un monito da rispettare. In uh, our work, uh, Casa Artusi Foundation is still inspired by the three principles of the work of Pellegrino Artusi, hygiene, economy and good taste. Uh, we, we can see that these principles are quite uh, common and uh, also, in, also nowadays. Io ringrazio moltissimo ancora per l'incontro di oggi. Avremo modo, quindi, grandissima occasione per noi di conoscere la cultura gastronomica sudanese e quindi questo mi sembra, come dire, particolarmente suggestivo rispetto al nostro, al nostro lavoro e anche Foriero spero di nuove collaborazioni. Grazie, grazie a tutti di cuore. I thank you all for organizing this webinar. Uh, it will be, I'm sure, uh, an occasion to uh, know more about uh, the Sudanese uh, cuisine, so a very important occasion for us. And I also hope that uh, uh, this webinar can lead to uh, other co or collaborations uh, in the future.
Grazie mille, Presidente, per le sue belle parole. Uh, thank you very much, President Antoni, for your uh, words. Uh, now, uh, to complete what you said, we will uh, uh, watch uh, a short video uh, realized by Casa Artusi on the bicentenary of Pellegrino Artusi. I kindly ask Director Patrita to share her video with us.
Thank you, Director Patrito. Patrito. Uh, I was not able to, to listen to the audio, but thanks to the English subtitles we could follow. And it is very interesting. And I, I think I will visit for Limpopoli because it's a very beautiful uh, small town. Uh, so thanks, thank you very much for, for sharing this video with us and uh, all the initiatives that Casa Artusi is uh, carrying out. Uh, now, uh, let's say we start with uh, this uh, dialogue between uh, Pellegrino Artusi and uh, Omer El Tijani. And before, let's say, an interactive session between uh, you and Chef El Tijani, I give you the floor again to uh, introduce us to the work of uh, Pellegrino Artusi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the, the video we share was just uh, an invitation, uh, as uh, my president, Lionel Tontoni, already had a chance to say. Um, we are not just, uh, uh, let's say, revising a bit. Um, meanwhile, we wait to meet you personally in Casa Artusi. As we had a chance uh, to say, Casa Artusi is um, a cultural center is uh, entirely devoted to Italian home cooking. We are in the heart of Italy. I, I, we decided to propose a map with Sudan and uh, Italy on the, on the same uh, slide. We are in the middle of, uh, um, of Italy. And as my president already said, uh, the little town of Forlimpopoli is of Roman origin, was built up during the Roman Empire when the Romans, 2,200 years ago, built streets. One of the streets was Via Emilia, and our region gets the name from the street and from Rome, Emilia Romagna. We always called this region the Via Emilia region. And the little town of Forlimpopoli is exactly on this street. Um, when we talk about Italy, when we name food, um, quite often we refer to two of the most iconic Italian products, like Parmigiano Reggiano or Aceto Balsamico Tradizionale, but not everybody knows that all these products come from this region. The region of the Via Emilia is often called the food valley of Italy. Uh, let me do a little promotion of our region because few of the guests that we have this morning may know our region because of uh, other iconic Italian product like cars, Ferrari cars, motorbike, Ducati, or thanks to the music of uh, Maestro Luciano Pavarotti or Maestro Riccardo Muti, the orchestra director. And uh, I'm sure that Chef Omer uh, knows his colleague, Chef Massimo Buttura, one of the best chefs in the world that we had the honor uh, to have in our region with a Parmigiano Reggiano wheel. This is one of the symbol of our region. Um, the little town of Forlimpopoli, I'm just sharing a few pictures. I hope to stimulate you visiting us. Every year, celebrate Pellegrino Artusi with a food festival. So this is an invitation. Every year, at the end of June, we celebrate Artusi with Festa Artusiana. Pellegrino Artusi. Hmm? Pellegrino Artusi is considered, as we said, father of Italian gastronomy. Uh, this gentleman was a businessman. He was born in 1820 in the little town of Forlimpopoli. And as already we had a chance to mention, my president, Laila Tentori, quite often she says, Pellegrino Artusi is the gastronome who lived in the future. So let's revise a bit about this uh, man. 
he was a businessman. So try to guess at the end of 19th century of, in Italy. Uh, he used to travel because of his business. He used to be guest of the people he was doing business with. Uh, he really had a chance to taste the different typical dishes. And uh, in Italy, from north to center to south, our typical dishes are deeply different. No matter we are much smaller compared to Omar, the variety of the dishes is really um, the identity of Italian cuisine, as we already mentioned. So try to guess. He was a curious man, for sure. Every time he used to taste a new dish, he used to look for the recipe. But at that time, cooking was not so on fashion like nowadays. So we cannot figure out this rich businessmen go in the kitchen where the ladies were at that time. Mm -hmm. um, but he was a guest, so he was allowed to observe. Professor Massimo Montanari, um, a great food historian, president of our scientific committee, a few years ago wrote, if Mr. Pellegrino Artusi were alive nowadays, it would probably a food and travel blogger. So he used to discover dishes, to take no, and when he retired, 1891, he decided to collect all these recipes and publish a book. The book that we mentioned before is Science in the Kitchen and All of Eating Well a collection of 475 recipes from north to center to south. Then something really incredible happened. Uh, it was already quite interesting, the idea of writing a cookbook. At that time, cooking was not so on fashion like nowadays. But what even more incredible happened after this is that uh, um, People who could read this book because they brought it or because they received it at present, um, starting sending him letters. Not so obvious because, you know, at that time, Italy was just born. We mentioned our 2,200 years old history about Roman origin. But we have to remind that Italy as a country is very, very young. We became a country only in 1861. So Mr. Pellegrino Artusi publishing his book, he really published the first national Italian cookbook. We had cookbooks since Roman time, but this is the very first one after unification of Italy. Um, before unification, we had not only different areas, different countries, but we have also different languages, the dialect. It was only after unification of Italy that we decided to choose as a common language, the language that we used to speak in Florence, the language of Dante, of the divine comedy. And Mr. Pellegrino Artusi wrote this book. Um, please, my the first page of the book, you see, printed in Florence. Artusi wrote this book, the first Italian national cookbook in Italian languages. So when people started sending him letters, there was a common language. And in these letters, there were not only compliments. There were recipes. People get involved in this uh, project. They were really modern followers. They were sent, sending contribution to Mr. Pellegrino Artusi. Thanks to these recipes, he was able to increase the number of recipes and publishing further edition of the book. First edition of the book, 1891, then he went on adding recipes, hmm? reaching the 15th edition in 1911, which is a collection of 790 recipes. 
this is not a story. This is part of our everyday life. Um, you can go in any bookstore in Italy and find these books um, published by the most important Italian editor. Because as we already had a chance to mention, uh, hygiene, economy, which means no waste and good taste are still part of our everyday life. This book has been published in English, French, German, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, Russian, Polish, and the last edition is uh, in Japanese, but um, our president, Laila Tentoni, is already working um, with China, with the embassies of Italy in China, on the project of translated Italian um, Artusi's book in Chinese. So maybe in Sudanese we can talk about. <laughs> this book inspired uh, Casa Artusi Foundation a cultural center dedicated to gastronomy and entirely devoted to Italian home cooking, like the home cooking that Artusi collected traveling in Italy. Um, Casa Artusi has been taught, uh, like his book, knowledge and know-how, knowledge and practice, sapere e saper fare. About the knowledge, we have three different libraries in Casa Artusi. The heart is the gastronomic uh, library. Uh, thanks to this, we represent, Artusi represents um, Italian food in the world. These are a few pictures. Um, probably my president reminded a picture that we took last year in, uh, at the Italian embassies in Berlin this year. Of course, the presentation was online, was a webinar. Mm -hmm. uh, today, thanks to you, thanks to the uh, Eric Sellens, the ambassador, and all your uh, staff, we have the chance to share Artusi legacy with Sudan. Yesterday evening, we were connected with uh, Argentina, which started with the States, uh, um, and we will finish with Russia uh, next week. The know-how, Casa Artusi is also a cookery school open to food lover. Uh, Professor Capati wrote to all the people which are willing to wear an apron and work with their hands. Um, our cooking classes are food, food lovers in particular. When we deal with pasta, which is a must, in Italy. Uh, the hands-on cooking experience is with the volunteers of the Cultural Association of Mariette. Mariette was Artusi's maid. Hmm? Um, we organize cooking classes which are master classes for professional cooks, of course, with field trips to cover Italian raw material, which are always the protagonist of Italian cuisine. Um, of course, we were, but we became, we became even more digital this year. So it's possible to have this experience also virtually. Uh, about the services that we have in Casa Artusi, we have a public library, we have few conference halls, we have a restaurant and wine cellar. Of course, we don't manage it directly as a foundation, uh, but it's part of the project. And of course, you can find everything about Casa Artusi uh, on our website, which is casartusi.it. And uh, until we wait to, we look forward to welcoming you in Italy, you can follow us, of course, on social, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube. Um, feel free to get in touch with us. Thank you so much. And uh, I give the floor to Dr. Manjola. Thank you very much, Director Patrito. This presentation was very uh, interesting and the quotation I've read in the very last slide, I love uh, uh, the beautiful and the good when wherever I find them, serves me the best assist now to uh, give the floor to uh, Chef Omer El Tijani that can tell us uh, more about the good and beautiful of the Sudanese cuisine, uh, of the Sudanese cuisine and of uh, 
his uh, personal project, The Sudanese Kitchen. Uh, so thank you again, director and Chef Omer, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Manjian. Uh, thank you everyone for, for this seminar. It's a wonderful honor of mine uh, to be here with you all and also to be talking about my work and in particular in comparison to the work of Caligula Artu. So it really is an honor that you see me in his vein. And I hope to uh, have the success that, and the impact that he's had uh, on, the, on the state of Italy today. So thank you for this wonderful opportunity. I'll also start with some slides myself as I tell you a bit about my work and uh, about Sudanese food. So I hope you can see this. Um, yeah, I'll start off with an introduction about Sudan. Not a lot of people know even that much about Sudan, let alone Sudanese food. Uh, where where I uh, when I grew up in the UK, so uh, the name Sudan comes from an old Arabic term actually meaning land of the blacks or land of the black people. So uh, because it's an Arabic term, it came kind of towards the latter part of the Sudanese history as kind of Arabs became uh, um, moving into the northern part of Sudan. Um, Sudan itself had the first African civilization in the Nubians based in northern Sudan here. We've got pyramids in Meroe, in Kerma, and, and, and all over Sudan, actually. Sudan actually has uh, the most pyramids out of any country in the world, which not many people know about. Uh, predominantly, there is Arabic spoken here, and the main language is, uh, main religion is Islam, but there are many, many other languages being spoken. I beg your pardon, Omer, sorry to interrupt, but yes. I can only see the last slide. Thank you, any questions? I don't know if you are, if it's just my problem or ah. maybe you are not projecting the... Attention. Ah, maybe I'm not projecting the right one. Let's try again. <laughs> Thank you for that. It should be here then. Can you see this now? Yes. Thank you. Can you hear me well? Great. Yeah, Thank you. I'll start again. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So, um, name Sudan comes from an old Arabic term, meaning land of the black people. Because it's an Arabic term, it comes at the latter part of our history. Sudan's obviously one of the oldest countries in the world and the cradle of life and, and human civilization across the globe. Um, saying that, Sudan has the first African civilization in the Nubians in northern Sudan. There are plenty of pyramids in Meroe and Kerma, and Sudan has the most number of pyramids in the world. The main language is Arabic, and the main religion is Islam. But there are many, many other languages being spoken and other religions being practiced. Throughout our history, we've been colonized by the Arabs, the Turks, and the Egyptians jointly, and then later by the British. This map shows you the terrain of Sudan. We're predominantly dry in the north, and as you move south and west, it becomes a lot, a lot lusher and greener. I do have to say that this map is a map of both Sudan and South Sudan, and this is the dividing line in between them. South Sudan seceded in 2011, and uh, the whole country was a state together um, in 1956. So again, quite relatively recent, but obviously its history goes millennia back. Yeah. Last year, there was a revolution um, and the people are hopefully moving towards a peaceful settlement and the government is currently finding its feet. So just a little brief background about Sudan. I've done a slide now to show you the old trade routes throughout um, the Eastern Mediterranean and throughout Asia. It's, it's just, I just want to show the movement of food around this part of the world. Yeah? As we mentioned, Sudan has the first African civilization around 5,000 years ago. At that time, people were mainly relying on the Nile, providing them with fresh water and food, as well as wild herbs and other vegetables growing wildly uh, on, the, on the banks of the river Nile. There wasn't really cultivation at that point. People were just living off the land mainly. And the Nile is kind of the main reason why this civilization became so strong, as it's the lifeline through this piece of land. At some point later, it's mentioned that ancient Indians made, made movements from the Indus Valley in Pakistan and, and India, the land in between there, and they, they arrived into the Nile Valley. 
What they brought with them was knowledge about how to rely on local grains such as sorghum and millet. And they even techniques and even the use of spices and things like this, which made a big impact on, uh, on the people of the Nile Valley at the time. Uh, after that, we have the rise of the ancient Christian empire in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, with Constantinople or currently Istanbul being its capital. This movement came into Northern Sudan as well as Egypt, of course, and they established many churches in, in, in Sudan, which again, not many people know about. At the time, Sudan was a predominantly Christian country up until later when the Arabs moved in. So what that brought, it actually influenced Eastern Mediterranean foods into Sudan, such as salads or breads, lentils, things like this. After that, we have the Islamic empire that again moved into Northern Sudan. That's the reason why we speak Arabic and the main language, uh, the main religion is Islam. And this brought kind of a Middle Eastern influence into Northern Sudan, which we still see today, of course. There's also like a sophistication around food, the more use of spices and a variety of things such as mezes and serving dishes. As Islam spread throughout Northern Africa and in particular West Africa, we have Muslims making the annual pilgrimage to Mecca and they would normally take the Sudan road from West Africa, predominantly Northern Nigeria and, uh, and Niger, through Sudan called the Sudan road. Now at the time, not everyone would make it all the way to Mecca, maybe their money wouldn't last or maybe they would nearly get there, but not quite. And they would end up staying in Sudan. So what this brought was an influence kind of more West African foods and brought that into the center of Sudan as well. So we, you really start seeing a mixture of, of different cultural influences centering around Sudan, which is why interesting because it's strategically positioned to be influenced by so, by so many cultures around there. As we said, food is the influence of cultures and the fusion of cultures. Uh, these groups from, from Nigeria and Niger, mainly the Hausa and the Fulani, developed fermentation and preservation techniques to deal with the harsh conditions and to deal with travel and migration across large pieces of land. This is things like the preservation of, uh, of meat, such as sharmut, which is dried meat and it's ground because it can travel, as well as asida and kistra, and the fermentation of, of local grains. Uh, later than that, we have the Turkish Empire, which colonized Sudan, as I mentioned, and this reinforced Eastern Mediterranean foods into Sudan again. Again, like a lot of more sophistication around foods, the Turks are very much known for their culinary expertise, and that really influenced the, the cuisine of, of Sudan at the time in a very big way. Um, a little later in the 1700s, the transatlantic slave trade unfortunately began between West Africa, South America, Central and North America. But not many people know that as the ships came back to West Africa, they actually brought South American ingredients into West Africa, which I believe Dr. Manyal uh, mentioned earlier. These are ingredients which we would normally assume are actually African, but they're originally South American. So these are cassava, chili, Bee, tomatoes, beans, peanut, pumpkin, and potato. Now, all of them apart from cassava are very common in Sudan. Cassava is common in South Sudan. So as you can see, these are all things that we would assume to be uh, Sudanese or, or African, but they're originally from South Sudan. In particular, the peanut in Arabic is known as full Sudani, Sudanese beans. That's the Arabic name for the peanut. But if you think about it, originally, this is an ingredient that came from South America and it obviously began to shape the way we eat around the world, which obviously influenced Italy as well at the time. So uh, let's just briefly discuss what we eat and how we eat it. This is a typical tray of food here in Sudan. We have like a mixed green salad. There's some falafel, which are in North Africa and the Middle East. Fool is very common in Sudan as well as other Arabic countries. Down here, we have like a peanut chili dip, very indigenous to Sudan, and we mentioned the ingredients before. Uh, to the left here, this is actually chopped liver. It just goes to show that the Sudanese do enjoy meat, but they also enjoy making the most out of the, the slaughter of the, of the animal. They wouldn't just have the meat and throw the rest away. They actually have very inventive dishes uh, that make use of the whole animal. Um, in the center, there is something called mulah with gorasa 
Mullah has a type of gravy. It's a rich stew that's uh, homogenous. It's consistent and it's uh, slow cooked and, and it's very rich. The bread on top is a type of pancake bread. And it's similar to an injera, but it's not quite as fermented. So these are breads that we use to kind of hold our food together uh, to, to aid eating. In Islamic groups, bismillah is, is, uh, is said at the beginning of, of dishes, uh, of meals, and at the end is alhamdulillah, it's giving thanks to Allah. Um, there's normally a metal circular tray um, being as the serving plate, with also a decorative cover that would sit on top called the tabak to keep the food warm. As you can see, people use bread to kind of lift the food, not just the bread here, as well as the barasa, something called kisra, and something called asida as well. People are also sharing all of these plates. They're eating all together. There is not individual plate for different people. People actually share the plates, but just eat from their sides and they use hand feeding. So as you can see, if we, if we were sharing the central plate, everyone would just eat from their side. And it's, uh, we have etiquette around not eating from other people's side. So in, and there's this sophistication around being close and being intimate with meals, but also having an etiquette about how to eat um, with good manners. So yeah, thank you. I just wanted to briefly tell you about my work. These are my links. I have an Instagram and a Twitter, social medias with um, Facebook and some videos on YouTube as well. So thank you for this uh, opportunity and we'll open the floor for discussions. Thank you very much for uh, Omer for this uh, journey into Sudanese cuisine since uh, it is already uh, noon here in Sudan uh, I can say that now you you are making uh, more difficult for me to 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 <laughs> to continue the conversation because now I want to taste what you just shown but uh, okay we have now half an hour for this uh, interactive dialogue, uh, let's say, distance dialogue between Pellegrino Artusi, uh, re-embodied in uh, director Patrito, and, uh, uh, and you. So um, yeah. I thank both of you for your presentation, and I wanted to ask uh, director Patrito, uh, somehow we understood it in the, in the presentation, but how, what was the, the very uh, first reason that uh, drove uh, uh, Mr. Artusi uh, and led him to write uh, his cookbook? Probably, um, as we said, uh, Mr. Pellegrino Artusi was, uh, um, um, I think that if I say um, that when we travel, and we taste a typical dish, we get in touch with one of the most authentic expression of the culture of a place, we probably all agree about it. But at that time, it was not so obvious. So he had this great intuition that food is culture. Uh, when he writes a recipe, it's not ingredient and automated. First of all, it tells us a story. It tells about the family, the place, uh, um, it gives us a pictures, pictures of Italy, okay? Um, at the same time, and now I'm going to read exactly what he wrote in recipe number nine, which is tortellini, a fillet uh, and made pasta with eggs. He, I'm reading from the book. Uh, I'm not an expert. Our great food historian taught us um, nourishment being life's primary need, it is certainly reasonable not to take care of this need and satisfy in the best manner possible. So nourishment is a need. Let's satisfy it in the best way, which is not food, but is conviviality, is a, a way of life. Thank you, Director Patrida. This is very, a very interesting quotation. And I'm sure that if I now ask uh, Chef Omer, how did he get uh, the idea to, to write the Sudanese kitchen, he will answer me with a similar, uh, with a similar uh, reply. Is that uh, uh, like this, Omer? Uh, what, 
led you yeah. to write the Sudanese kitchen? Yeah, so, somewhat uh, to a large degree, actually. I think because uh, I was based in the UK and I'd visit Sudan every, every year, every other year or so. And I was living away from home. I was living in, in Manchester University and there wasn't an access to Sudanese food for me. I'd, I'd go home and I'd, I'd have my family's food and then I'd, I'd miss it when I'd live on my own. So for me, as a, as a young, man, young man interested in food, I wanted to be able to make that food myself uh, when I was away from it. So, you know, I began to look online and I found some recipes, but not a lot, and maybe not done in a in a good or accurate way. And we, we find our access, especially these days, we find access to all the world's food available readily on, online or anything like this, even in books, food books, but not necessarily Sudanese food. And I thought, what a shame that we, you know, we have such a big cultural impact of food, um, but it's not really recorded and it's inaccessible to many people. So I really began to take it on myself to just collect recipes. At first, it was just for myself so I could make food while I was living away from home. But then I realized the cultural impact and the importance of these recipes and the importance of this preservation of food. And I began to yeah, do this work and I began to seek funding to, to make a much bigger compilation of, of our culture's food. And yeah, as the ambassador said, I, I feel like I must be mad because the, the, the undertaking is, is so large for a country as big and diverse as Sudan, but I think it's necessary. It's actually very important, in fact. So that's the reason, due to a lack of information and access around Sudanese food. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Uh, and uh, now I am I, reading that the ambassador also has also a question for for you, I think, or for both uh, Director Patrita and Omer. So I'll uh, give the floor to him. Thank you, Fortunato. I actually have a thousand questions for both, but I have to restrain myself because uh, you're the, the interesting ones to hear, so I'll be short. One question for Omer and one question for, for both of you. As a, as a Sudanese, after, based on what you know and what you've heard, where do you see the conjunction point between Italian cuisine and the Sudanese habits? In other terms, I'm asking you to give advice to your competitors. If you were an Italian <laughs> seeking to, you know, bring Sudanese people to, to, his, to his or her restaurant, where would you start? What's the conjunction point? And then a provocative question, but not so much, to both of you. We live in an age where people like to eat very much. Sudanese, Italian people alike, you see them eating out, irrespective of what they earn, irrespective of where they come from. A noi tutti piace mangiare, soprattutto mangiare fuori, italiani, sudanesi. It's cultural. Uh, we, we each occasion for a meeting revolves around food and the lunch or a dinner table. Ogni occasione di incontro include del cibo. Ci piace sederci a tavola, stare insieme a tavola. In fact, if you're a Sudanese, food normally, as we have seen, goes directly from the mouth through bread. You don't even use a fork. It's that personal. It's that direct. Il cibo va direttamente dalla, dalla mano alla bocca, estremamente personale. We live in an age where people, especially young people and even less young people like myself, we cook less and less because we're in a hurry, because we don't have time, because we don't have patience and cooking is about patience a lot. So isn't writing or promoting a cookbook a revolutionary act? How do you bring it closer to the people? Uh, those would be my questions. Thank you very much. 
thank you. I'll, I'll try and attempt to answer the first one. Um, where is the conjunction point between uh, Sudanese people uh, and Italians and how would we get Sudanese people to enjoy Italian food? I guess they're very similar in many ways. It's a home food, people being together. As you said, there's an intimacy and a warmth around, around both experiences. So I think something like that, like really stressing on the, the fact of bringing people together at a very large table, uh, quality ingredients, and just a really nice intimate experience. I think Sudanese people can definitely uh, enjoy Italian food as they, as they enjoy many other foods as well. But, but the, the conjunction point is around that intimacy around the table. And when I think of an Italian table, there's, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of passing, there's maybe some shouting. And it's, it's that kind of activity that I think the Sudanese would, would really might like to engage in and uh, people just getting involved as much as possible with trying many different things. Uh, I really do see a lot of similarities between the two, even though the, maybe the practice might be different, as you said, hand feeding and even and specific ingredients and things like this. But it's about the connection with food and with people that I think is the strongest. I might have to ask for a reminder about the other questions, or maybe I could, we could open it to... Dr. Silva. Probably my president, Laila Tentoni, can reply to the question of the ambassador, and I will be pleased to help with the translation. A dicembre 2019, abbiamo fatto un'indagine con il Censis, proprio per capire quanto gli italiani mantenevano il piacere di cucinare. Era ottimistico di quello che avremmo immaginato. Lo scenario era che tutti mangiano fuori, delivery, fast food, surgelato. Invece da questa indagine abbiamo capito come gli italiani non hanno mai disertato il convivio e la tavola, l'hanno sicuramente ridotta, ma non hanno mai rinunciato a trovarsi attorno al tavolo, anzi femminile, alla tavola, alla tavola la sera, i giorni festivi e ogni occasione per festeggiare. Poi, non so se Susi finisco il ragionamento, tanto il ragionamento che ci siamo già fatti ancora, Abbiamo visto che durante, ahimè, questa pandemia che ci costringe per l'appunto a comunicare in questa modalità, tutti hanno ricominciato a cucinare. Parlo ad esempio della realtà che più conosco, l'Italia. Per quale ragione la farina non si trovava più e il lievito? Perché qualcuno ha sempre continuato ad usare. E qualcuno, ad esempio anche la mia generazione, nella memoria che sia visiva o olfattiva c'era il gesto di cucinare. Quindi devo dire che la pratica domestica in realtà adesso in questa contingenza è molto praticata anche perché gli italiani l'hanno sempre amata. Io confido che questo corso di economia domestica obbligatorio in realtà ci faccia guardare al futuro con più serenità. Uh, President Laida Tentoni is reminded that um, Casa Artusi Foundation, uh, in cooperation with Censi's Foundation, made a uh, research. It was um, an official research that has been published on uh, the principal newspapers in Italy. Um, it, it was, um, there is, was a kind of an inquiry. We asked people how often they cook and eat at home. We all know and we agree with uh, the ambassador that we are not so often at home and we don't cook so often. Um, no matter if we are Italian, delivery, fast food, um, we are more, we are more uh, for street food and fast food in Italy. Mm? <laughs> Anyhow, it's part of our everyday life. Um, and in this um, research was 
it was incredible. It surprised us to find out that Italian people never gave up with the habitude of sharing at least one meal a day in, at home in the family, um, especially for us. I mean, we are Italian, we, especially on Sunday for every family and special families event. event. Mm -hmm. um, during lockdown, it was quite hard to find in the stores flour and yeast. Uh, we don't make bread at home usually, but each of us was able, because we had in our mind how to do it, how to make it, and then it was easy, simply give a call to a granny, maybe, <laughs> to give, to get some uh, advices. Uh, so we were forced to own cooking, and uh, we discovered that food is comfort food, and being at home, sharing a meal, is part of our identity. Um, you feel safe when you feel you have your own identity. And we had a chance to discuss with, with Chef Omer in the past days, and we said, if you are sure about who you are and where you will come from, you can face the world and you can be open completely to the world, as Artusi was. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And if we talk about those trends of young people these days, it also affects uh, people here in Sudan as well. Maybe with the modernization of media, the access of online recipes, more and more young people are, uh, in Sudan, at least, are making not necessarily Sudanese recipes, but other recipes from, from around the region. Um, we do see, especially, I think it's, it would be safe to say that women are the gatekeepers of Sudanese food and and as more and more young women enter the workforce and, and don't know how to have access or the time to, to preserve this food, we, we actually see like a trend of that these recipes are, are being lost almost or people aren't really knowing about them. It's only really the grandmothers and, and older ladies who, who know this food and know these recipes. And they are trying to pass it down, but I don't think it's, it's being taken up by young people as much. So I do hope that with this work that we're doing, I can give access to those people uh, to make these recipes and as we discussed identity uh, it's also important for people like myself who are raised outside of the UK to have access to this to this cultural identity even more when you're living in the west or elsewhere uh, as a Sudanese person I think it's important to have access to your food because it gives you this kind of comfort and sense of identity that we discussed before um, so yeah I think that's that's very very important uh, going forward for young people um, but yeah food is Food is culture, food is life, and, and it's the, the kind of, I, I want to empower people. Uh, it is a revolutionary act. You're right, Ambassador. Uh, I do see kind of this movement as, uh, as something going against the grain. And it's, it's about kind of, for me, empowering people and saying, no, we don't have to succumb to the, the modernization of the world or capitalism and the fact that we don't have time and we're constantly chasing something. Food is about patience and food is about stopping and and about um, yeah, making the most of what's around us, um, not just ingredients, but also people taking time for each other. Uh, so I hope this, this continues to um, empower people to enjoy Sudanese food, not just for Sudanese people, but obviously not many people know about Sudanese food. So I hope this project puts Sudanese food on the map and allows it to be enjoyed by not just Sudanese, but by everyone, uh, which is important. So I really hope this uh, is the beginning of kind of an emergence of, uh, of our food on the world stage and that one day we will also have uh, an international week of Sudanese food as we're also celebrating Italian food as well. <laughs> I'm not sure if I answered all the questions by the ambassador. Please remind me if there's another one. My job as a moderator is very easy here because I can see that the, di the, the la dialogue is quite... Uh, uh, easy for you. I mean, when we speak about cuisine and, and culture and the exchange is quite natural. I, I, I really feel uh, uh, I cannot do, I do not have to do something, uh, something uh, extra, let's say. Um, but I had a, a curiosity uh, and a question to, to Omar. 
what were the main challenges that you had to face in like finding the recipes? Uh, I think that these are also uh, challenges related to language because as you say, these are yeah. grandmother's recipes and in Sudan, yeah. there are different languages, different regions. Yeah. Um, how was your, your work? Uh, yeah, to, um, to put it lightly um, and to put it shortly, it was extremely challenging, but hopefully we're, we're persevering through that, through the language barriers, but also the communication of specific quantities. It's not just the access to the, the foods themselves that are from different regions that you probably have to access with different languages, but also it's the, as maybe Ms. Artusi tried to discover, that it's the quantities that are really important. And we, when we talk about the gatekeepers of this food here in Sudan, at least, they don't work with the measurements. They don't work with anything specific. They, they just, they know how much they need. And as someone who is trying to record that, it's extremely difficult to, to get to the actual amount of, of the ingredient that they, that they put into the dish. So uh, it was challenging to, for me, number one, to represent the diversity of Sudanese food. Uh, Sudanese people are extremely diverse, uh, as, you can, as you can see from our size and the different influences that we have in our, in our country. Um, so yeah, paying representation to all of those groups is extremely, extremely difficult, uh, as well as to accurately record the recipes. Now that's, that's something very, very challenging as well. I also faced a lot of difficulties as a man entering the field of food here in Sudan as well. There are plenty of challenges with family, but with also the wider community, people asking me why I'm interested in this. Isn't this something that women should be interested in and, and, and so on and so forth. So yes, I, I could go on, but uh, I'll probably lose my mind if I do. So um, let's, let's leave it there. And we saw the floor to the ambassador that has raised his hand. Sorry, but it, this is just too interesting. So every now and then I have to come by and, and eat a question. Uh, um, both of you discussed quantities. I have another question, both for Casartusi and for Omer. How expensive is good food? Uh, we see in both countries that you've got a very wide variety of menus. You've got a wide variety of, uh, of, of uh, restaurants, a, a wide choice of food for the consumer and indeed the cook for us to choose from. Uh, we face it as a regular question when we're promoting Italian food uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Sudan. We want to uh, come up with an offer that is accessible for the average person in this country. But I think it is just as relevant a question for someone operating in the Italian market uh, quanto, quanto costa, quanto è costoso per una persona mangiare bene in una maniera che sia eh, appagante e al tempo stesso eh, sana e conforme alla nostra tradizione. Is that expensive or is there a way of you know, eating accordingly to our own resources without eating what I use, uh, how I used to put it, everything that falls naturally from a supermarket shelf. È possibile mangiare sano in una maniera che sia economicamente, come dire, eh, ragionevole, senza mangiare, per usare una mia espressione, tutto quello che cade naturalmente dallo scaffale di un supermercato? Ecco, vi giro la questione. Thank you. Io provo a rispondere, se posso. <ride> allora, proprio l'altra sera abbiamo fatto un incontro con il professor Segre che fa parte del comitato scientifico di Casa Artusi, conosciuto in Italia e direi in diversi paesi per tutto lo studio che ha fatto contro lo spreco. 
e lui ha proprio fatto un'analisi economica sul mangiare con la dieta mediterranea e con numeri alla mano ha proprio dimostrato che se noi rispettiamo quelle indicazioni che non sono prescrittive, proprio uno stile di vita per cui alla base mettiamo frutta e verdura e cerchiamo di comprarla come diceva il nostro caro vecchio Artusi nel momento in cui costano poco, cioè al massimo della maturazione e magari con una parola che ormai non se ne può più, che sarebbe chilometro zero, però andiamo dal contadino, questo costa veramente poco e c'è modo di mangiare bene e anche mangiare salutare. Carboidrati, la pasta, la pasta costa poco. Addirittura vi posso dire, noi romagnoli, noi romagnoli amiamo la pasta fatta in casa, che ancora si fa con la sfoglia, col materello, fatta da uomini, da donne, da ragazzi. Questa costa pochissimo. Acqua e farina in alcuni casi, nei casi più evoluti, a farina e uova e devo dire che se abbiamo poco tempo cuocere una tagliatella servono tre secondi cioè il tempo del bollore una buona pasta secca la devi cuocere almeno 13 14 minuti quindi per dire che c'è possibilità con attenzione però bisogna dedicarci un po di pensiero si può mangiare bene spendendo paradossalmente di meno e stare in salute. What else? Cos'altro? Meglio di così. It's absolutely possible. Uh, we had a chance uh, during one of these webinars that, that uh, took place during the um, week of Italian cuisine uh, to participate to a seminary where Professor Segre, which is part of our scientific committee, Um, is um, involved, is the promoter of the no waste movement. And he was able uh, to demonstrate with figures that uh, it's possible, according to the Mediterranean diet, diet to lead a safe lifestyle, a healthy lifestyle, um, without extending too much. Um, let's think about the pyramid of the Mediterranean diet. At the base of the pyramid, we have vegetables and fruits. And these must be local, must be seasonal. If you buy them when they are in season, they are the best about nutrition fact, and they are the cheapest during uh, season. And so the largest portion of our meal should be vegetables and fruits. The next step are carbohydrates. So pasta is a must in Italy and it's just wheat flour and water or wheat flour and eggs as we do in our region. It's cheap, it's quick, um, it's absolutely possible to lead a healthy lifestyle and not spend too much. Of course, for special events, a um, few drops of um, extra virgin olive oil is not so expensive. Um, I, I, in the Mediterranean area, we, we have plenty of, of olive oil. Um, maybe a little bit of parmigiano just to, to celebrate, so, but you don't need large quantity. So it's absolutely possible. Thanks for asking. Yeah, uh, likewise, I'd, I'd have to agree with everyone as well. And in particular, in the case for Sudan, the foundation of Sudanese food is based on accessible ingredients. It's based on local fruits and vegetables, uh, local grains such as sorghum and millet, which are made in extremely large quantities and accessible to everyone at a very small cost. There's, yeah, it's, it's always been that way. And I think um, even in Sudan, with the, with the way it currently is, the economic situation here, Food has uh, always remained accessible uh, to many people. There's only a very small portion of the population that can, can access such fine, fine ingredients, but the vast, vast majority has access to accessible food. And yes, that food is excellent. Uh, but even more recently, 
in, uh, in, in current economic situation in Sudan, is, as it's been deteriorating, less and less uh, common person, let's say, can have access to certain special ingredients that may be more expensive, which would predominantly mean meat, essentially. Now, a lot of the foundation of Sudanese food is actually also in meat as well. It makes our stews richer and kind of stocks are very commonly used as the base for either soups or stews. Now, even in light of such difficulties economically, Sudanese food can still be made without meat by many people, uh, and it still remains as good quality, mainly because of the ingenuity of, uh, of Sudanese cooks and being able to be versatile with how they make things. So even, even in, let's say, the last five, 10 years, Sudanese food is made without meat, and it remains excellent. So yes, I, I have to agree. Thank you, Omar. Uh, we have uh, six minutes left. So maybe before giving the floor to the ambassador for some uh, final conclusions, I had one last question. Uh, we see that what Omar is doing uh, is present and uh, uh, Mr. Artusi did, did, did something very similar 200, almost 200 years ago. So uh, if uh, Pellegrino Artusi was able to do it, what kind of advice would he give to, to Chef Artigian? So that's my final question for Director Patrito. I can only answer uh, with Artusi's book. And uh, since we have 790 recipes, um, I have to make a summary, and our scientific committee helped me with this. Um, so let me share you the 10 pieces of advices that uh, represent Artuzzi's book. Um, Artuzzi would probably suggest to respect natural ingredient, to use quality ingredient, he wrote, because they will make you shine. Um, to use seasonal ingredient, as we mentioned a few seconds ago, to be simple, passionate, attentive and precise, to be passionate, to vary, respecting territory and season. But if you vary, you must do it with good taste. Values the simplest of cooking. Um, ambassador, most of the most more popular dishes, like I think about pasta and beans, uh, are smart, cheap, and easy. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last advice uh, deals with uh, the way Mr. Artusi wrote his book. It was, uh, um, I, I read from the catalog of uh, the exhibit, Artusi and the Italian unity at the table that we share. Uh, with the world, uh, Artusi wrote uh, being ironic and always accomplished with the reader. So he would say, do not trust cookbook. I, I think that this is the, the irony we needed to end this uh, very interesting dialogue. And uh, I'm quite sure that Omer is still uh, following this advice, uh, all the previous nine at least. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I now give the floor to the ambassador to uh, close our webinar and uh, draw on some conclusions of this very interesting dialogue. Grazie Fortunato, thank you. I, it only falls to me to uh, thank you, uh, thank all the participants. This is one seminar that I really didn't want to end. Uh, I had a number of questions. Non, non, non volevo veramente che questo seminario finisse perché è stato interessantissimo e avevo una quantità di domande. It shows us once again that food is about uh, how we live, not just what we eat in so many ways. Um, 
Il cibo riguarda tutto il nostro stile di vita, il cibo ci dà la possibilità di determinarci in una maniera essenziale, se sappiamo come usarlo. Knowledge about food means empowerment in our everyday life. The sooner we realize it, the better. Let me hope that this is not the end, but the beginning of a conversation. I commit to continue working with you at Casa Artusi and with Omer to think of new initiatives to undertake uh, at this time when we are forced to cooperate from a distance and when it is possible to meet again, because I think this is useful, it is relevant, it's beautiful. It really gave me, gave me an appetite, if one can say so, for more. Mi alzo da tavola con tanto appetito e, e, e vorrei continuare a lavorare con tutti voi come ambasciata per cercare di portare più Italia in Sudan e più Sudan in Italia, anche da questo punto di vista. Credo che possa essere interessante per tutti e per chi, e per chi ci ascolta. È stata un'ispirazione. Grazie a tutti. Questa non è la fine, ma l'inizio di un progetto. This is not the, the end, but the beginning of a project. Let us all take it from here. Thank you very much to everyone. Grazie, Grazie a tutti. Grazie. Buongiorno, ciao. Bye. 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 Arrivederci. Arrivederci. Ok.